This is an old Taycan owner's manual, and this is a new Taycan owner's manual. This is my new one because I just had the latest software update. As part of that process, Porsche had to take my old manual and destroy it. I have an old one here from another Taycan next to mine. So this video here is going to be all about the latest uh, and big software update that Porsche has just released for the Taycan that includes uh, updates to older cars like my 2021 Dirty Martini 4S here. So in this video, I'm going to run through the differences with this new software and what it means for Taycan owners. I think mine's probably one of the first in the UK to have had this done. My car was just in having a uh, recall on a seat wine loom or something replaced and they did that for me uh, last week. So I'm going to run through the differences uh, because there's quite a few new things promised. Not going to be a clever video, this one, because my colleague Gintz is off and he normally does camera work and editing, but I'll do what I can with this GoPro and show you around. So, yeah, it's kind of strange, isn't it? We're used to Tesla. has been a Tesla owner for many years and they've been receiving software updates uh, over the air continuously over those years to keep the cars up to date. It's one of the fascinating things about electric cars is that software updates are always coming through and that not just how the screen looks and how you use it, but also carries with it uh, efficiency gains, maybe differences in charging speeds, and all that kind of stuff. So it's interesting how the cars continuously evolve, which you just wouldn't have had with previous ICE cars. And included in that is a Taycan, but it did have to go to Porsche to have this done. Now, part of this software update, and it's the second large update I've had done this car in the one year of ownership. It's one of the only cars I've owned for a year, by the way, so I do like the Taycan, there's proof of the pudding. Uh, it's the second time it's gone in for software updates. Um, and it's kind of a strange concept, isn't it? But nonetheless, let's uh, move forward with that. But what I did think was strange is that Porsche have to see the old manual, had to dig it out of the file and give them the old owner's manual, which they have to destroy uh, as part of the process of then installing the new software updates. And then they give you a new owner's book here. So I'm going to put this back with this car next to it here. So I can show you a couple of side by side. In fact, all three of the cars here in our showroom are actually uh, 4S's. So, I'm going to get in this one here, which is how mine started out before the, uh, the wrap, actually. So mine was a white one like this. And then, of course, it's got the famous dirty martini wrap. And let's have a look inside this car first. And I'll show you what the Porsche software looks like. So let me just uh, turn the camera around here. So when you start the car up, it will load up like this. Let me turn the music off. And it takes a little moment to load up. It's one of my bugbears with the Porsche Taycan. I love the car, like I say, proved the point. It's one of the only cars I've owned for a year. They're fantastic, I do love mine. Uh, but uh, the software is one thing I've always sort of moaned about a little bit. It's not particularly visual, it's a little bit laggy, uh, so it does need some improvement to it. And I'm hoping this will be the change that it needs. So. When it starts up, it all looks much like this. You've got your lower display here, which is typically your climate functions on here. Uh, you can bring up or reduce some shortcut buttons here, which I think are very useful. So if you didn't know about this little button here underneath the sink, I find that brilliant. It gives you your shortcuts here to go to navigation, for example. But you can just see there, there's that little bit of lag and delay. And if I go back to the home screen, you can see here, you've got the option to show three widgets, but it's very black and white. It's kind of functional, albeit a little bit slow to respond at times. You go to this one quite a lot, the car function, where you might adjust your driving mode, your chassis height, um, recuperation, and recuperation one of the things that's changed. And you can fund through that. And interestingly, what I used to have on mine as well was this uh, option of the display here. You can change all these displays in this console here, but one of them here was the uh, visual for the distribution of power between the front and rear motor. And one of the things Porsche has changed with the software update is how that power is distributed because they want to make the cars more efficient. So they promised some efficiency gains and I probably will try and see if I can notice more efficiency in my car. I haven't really had time to test that yet. What I'm going to focus on in this video is really how does this look different and what has changed here uh, in the whole software update process. But interestingly, this visual is no longer on my car. Uh, I was looking for it for ages, but it just isn't there. It's, it was on there. I know it was on there, but it's not there anymore. In fact, this Taycan 4S next to me here hasn't had this big software update yet. But again, that doesn't have that visual. I thought I was making things up, but then that one still got it. And I, I've gone through the menu process where you would activate it, and I can show you that. But let me come around now to my new software updated car. 
I'll tell you what, I'll clip the camera on just to keep it steadier. And then you can should be able to see the screen. There. Okay, so I'm going to start my car up. Let's have a look. You have to push the start button to start it up. But you can also, with the Porsche, if you just get in it and uh, hit drive, it usually starts up as well. So I haven't really looked for the owner's manual. I mean, you know, I'm a bloke, why would I look through the owner's manuals? But uh, uh, I'm sure there's some changes in there. Uh, but let's just have a look at what you see differently on the screen here. So I've got a view of the camera there. So it, yeah, look, you can see it's different. We've got some color. We've got some color here for those shortcut icons. So that's good. And then this section here is all more vivid and colorful. So that's good. However, it kind of seems to largely stop there. Once you actually go into something like navigation, it all looks much the same, to be honest. If I go to, well, any of the settings, really, if I go to the car settings here, well, that all looks the same, doesn't it? So actually, once you go into any one of the menus, it all looks actually much the same. Doesn't seem to be too much difference on there at all. Uh, is it faster? Is it less laggy? I don't think so. It's, again, sort of okay, um, but it does lag sometimes. And I do find myself sometimes hitting an option menu, it's delayed, so I push it again, and it has then moved on to the next menu, and then you selected something you don't want to set. It's all usable, but it is just a bit behind other modern car software systems. So not amazing, but certainly functional. And I like the extra color here now. Um, so in here, in this display here, I no longer have that all wheel option. I can show tra assistant systems, traffic signs, G-force and tire info. That's it, it's disappeared. Now you would get to that uh, by going to settings, display, uh, instrument cluster, configure display scope. And you see, I've got all seven of seven active. So it's not like it's just not selected in this menu, by the way, if you're a tire can owner. I'm aware of that and it's just not selected. So I'm not sure why. Okay, let's go back to the home here. So Android Auto's uh, integrated now. And I think I've read they're also promising Spotify, but I don't seem to have any Spotify option on here now. In fact, I'll read out some of the options that uh, the uh, update should include so this is the newsroom letter from um, uh, Porsche and if you're a Taycan owner you should have received something like this basically so 2023 software update and they call it update with a capital P just because there's a reason I can't remember why uh, so apparently this now will include uh, will enhance the over the air update capability of all Taycan models so there will now be more over the air updates this is a free update and will be carried out free for customers, um, but it must be carried out during a visit to Porsche shop, uh, workshop. Uh, so don't forget to take your old user manual so they can destroy it. I didn't have mine in the car at the time and actually someone from Porsche came to my office, collected the old manual and took it back so they could destroy it and prove to Porsche. And that's how essential that was to the process. So yeah, that was a kind of a strange one for me. So. In this newsletter here, it, it reads out that the uh, campaigns for uh, will allow our customers to benefit from the continuous further development of the Taycan. Uh, so there's a bit of waffle in there. Uh, the precise scope of the update and duration of the necessary workshop to visit will depend on specific software status of the Taycan in question. Mine had the other bigger update a few months ago, so mine was, I think, reasonably up to date. It had been doing over-the-air map updates and such like in the meantime anyway. Uh, and indeed, then they had the car for uh, a couple of days, basically. I think if it's all pre-booked, you can probably have it done in, in one day, I should think. Um, so it says here, right, the uh, most important updates at a glance, powertrain. So in the normal and range driving modes, the, the partial load operation from the front electric motor is almost completely disconnected and de-energized. So while coasting at the standstill, both axles are actually free from drive torque. Um, so more like an electric free wheel action. Now, one of the things you don't really get that much of with a Taycan is much regenerative braking. Uh, when you lift off the brake, it sort of tends to coast anyway. You tend to use the brake, unlike with something like a Testa, for example. Um, and even on something like the Audi GT, which has paddles, the paddles don't really do much. The most useful function on the uh, Taycan is the auto recuperation. So if I set the recuperation to auto, 
it tends to coast, but if you are coming up to another vehicle obstruction or junction, it then does apply regen uh, to the car automatically. So it's kind of coast, but will regen. If you just have regen on, you don't feel that much uh, regenerative effect, just a little bit. Um, I think they're trying to keep the car driving yeah, more like a conventional car most of the time, basically. Um, so the automatic recoup setting, for example, is retained when the driver changes the driving program. So the issues to sort of change, you go to normal, then the range back to normal, then this would go to off, for example. But if I put this in auto, it should stay on auto when I switch between the different driving modes. So one of the interesting things here is for efficiency, um, other than how they're uh, disengaging and de-energizing motors, and uh, I think now prioritizing drive from the rear motor, I think, is uh, the thermal management, so better conditioning of the battery, especially at low outside temperatures. So it's pretty warm in the UK at the moment, not able to test that, but the thermal efficiency and waste heat uh, distribution uh, seems to have been improved, allegedly. So then the communication, the PCM, uh, so new functions, a colorful tile design on the start screen and ease of use. So I wouldn't get too excited about that. If you dig around in here, there's gonna be some little bits and pieces, but I noticed the Sport Chrono tab here. This has changed a little bit, so you can hit there, you can start recording um, and you can compete against the stored lap. And then there's an evaluate tab there as well. So you can look back at various data uh, from lap timings and such like. So that has changed a little bit. I uh, don't know quite what options are on there. So you can import and export your recordings of lap data. So that's kind of interesting. It doesn't record from cameras. There aren't cameras on the car that record, but just in terms of timing on the lap. Um, so yeah, okay. There's a little bit there extra, I think. Uh, one thing whilst I think of it here, which has come up more recently with the Taycan, uh, so I'm sort of digressing a little bit from this software update specifically, is about this uh, sort of kind of option. If you go into the charge menu, um, and then you hit this little three icons down here, it's a little bit tucked away, battery saving, fast charging. So this is something that's come about recently. In fact, then Bjorn has brilliantly uh, shown a bit more of this more recently as well. Um, so this, although the Taycan can charge really fast, 260 plus kilowatts on a really good fast charger, which is remarkable. It's one of the, obviously, the fantastic things about this car. Uh, there is concern about, you know, what would the longevity uh, uh, problem be with the battery if, if um, you did that a lot. So there is this option here, which I've turned on in mine, which is battery saving fast charging, which would limit the charging speed to 200 kilowatts. Now, that then just puts less intensity through the battery. It stops the battery getting as hot when you're charging, which is gonna be a good thing for long-term life of the battery. Now, I'll be honest, this car has had a replacement drive battery at about 27,000 miles. First time I've had a battery issue in a car. It was still driving, but it come up some errors and to be sure Porsche changed it. And there's been a few cases like that. So maybe if you always charge at over 260 kilowatts, there is a detrimental effect uh, with uh, the batteries. So I'll turn this function on. Now, it will charge slower, but 200 kilowatts is still a very, very fast charging speed, sustained for quite a long time. Uh, things like testers can go over 200 kilowatts, but then they come down very quickly. Again, probably mainly for thermal management. Now, what Bjorn did a brilliant video on is showing that if you go from a low state of charge up to 90%, the charging profile is actually just as quick uh, with this uh, because it, the battery doesn't heat up so much. It doesn't have to ramp down the charging speed as quickly. So instead of having a charge speed that goes really fast and then slows down, it goes fast for longer and actually gets to 90% about the same. However, you could have a really fast charging speed. If you're in a rush, you need a quick 10 minute top up and get going again. And by 10 minute top up, you can go from 5% to 55% in kind of 10, 11 minutes with one of these. It is phenomenal. However, 200 kilowatts is still fast. You do find with this charging speed, people want this super fast charging, but I was finding, especially if I'm away with the family, I'd have to leave eating my lunch to go and unplug the car and move it because it's all really charged. Which if it's a busy charging stall, I would do that anyway. But sometimes you just want to let it carry on up to 90%, just a little bit slower so you can finish your lunch without leaving it halfway through. Anyway, I digressed a little bit there. So yeah, a few different visuals and everything here, but not vastly different. You can see if you're typing and you go into any one of these, it then all looks much the same. And then we've got the color here on this screen as well for these shortcuts. So uh, it looks a little bit nicer there, doesn't it? Uh, what else have they got in here? So assistance systems. Um, 
Some assistance systems can now support the driver in even more situations. So sensors of the front park assist can now work with greater range, for example. Um, so there's a few little bits there. What I quite like with the Taycan, I've got a little shortcut button option here. And when I activate that, it goes to my parking sensors and I might use that to look at where the front wheel is when I'm approaching a curb, for example. Anyway, again, digress a little bit there. Uh, some, some minor improvements there. And then unlocking functions after vehicle purchase. All Taycan models from 2021 to 2022 are now also eligible on request for things like keyless opening function, comfort access. And it's one of the things you may have seen if you've seen my previous videos in this car. Much as I love it, I cannot believe some of the options and spec uh, on Porsche. For example, this car, when it was new, I believe was something like £126,000. And it doesn't have keyless entry. I actually used the button on the key to lock and unlock the car. First world problems and all that, but it's just something you don't really expect with a Taycan. But now, I can actually uh, acquire that if I want it. The option of over-the-air updates uh, has also now been expanded further for the model year. So I've requested to see how much the uh, keyless entry function is to be added to this. I haven't had a reply yet, but if I get that by the time we release the video, I'll add it in the description below. Or if it's before I edit the video, then uh, in the, uh, well, about here, in a bit of text at the bottom. So we'll see how we go with that. Uh, so, and then that's about that really. So those are the key things, but what I wanted to do, I will try and test range and everything a little bit more. Um, I did see Tom uh, in the States did a, a range test with a two wheel drive Taycan, which I think might not be quite as big a difference because it's only got the rear motor anyway. Uh, so there's only a limit to how much more efficient that can be. I think the 4S and, and turbo models will probably gain some more differences with efficiency. But that test there did show on 70 miles an hour highway test. Great video, Tom, well done. Um, was that that was a little bit more efficient. So he did over 300 miles in that example there, which is good. So I'll see if I can do some more uh, testing with this and I'll see if I can get the opportunity to do a side-by-side -side test with another 4S with the same wheels. And in fact, the one over there does have the same wheels as this one. You need to have the same wheels, otherwise the efficiency comparison wouldn't be fair. So if I get a chance to do that, I will do, but otherwise I will just see what I get uh, from this if I get a chance to cover a long journey with it in the coming days. So, good to see. Really not vast amounts. I wouldn't go rushing out to get it done tomorrow, but it is good news for Tycan owners that it is all moving forward. It is staggering how, you know, Tesla years ago, even back on 2014 cars, has integrated the ability for quite big over-the-air software enhancements, isn't it? So it goes to show, um, the, yeah, where, where Tesla come from, and that's fantastic. You get a notification with a Tesla. If your car wants to do an update on the app, you just say yes, and it goes and does its software update, which can include some quite big uh, changes and features. So interesting to see that. Uh, but... I'll probably do another review on this Taycan actually because it's one of the very few cars I've had for a year. So much as I can see, especially Tesla owners commenting below saying, you know, how, how silly is that? It's got to go to dealers for software updates, etc., etc. I agree. I think it is. <laughs> it's crazy. We should have really had all this uh, flowing quicker and sooner and all over the air. Um, but there's a lot of elements that, about the Porsche Taycan which are just fantastic. It is one of my two favorite EVs of all time. I've had it for a year. I keep getting tempted to sell this. In fact, I have just listed it for sale, but I don't know if I'm gonna regret it because I simply love driving it. You kind of forget its flaws when you drive it. This isn't even the fastest version, but it's just a fantastic thing. And, um, you know, sometimes things with flaws are even more lovable, aren't they? So, uh, yeah, more on this particular Taycan and a year of ownership to come. Uh, it's not been perfect. I've had issues. A lot of it technically isn't as good as something like a Tesla. It's not technically as good an electric car. It's never as efficient and all that kind of stuff, but I love it nonetheless. So that's a quick run through uh, if you're a Taycan owner really to see what visual differences we've got here from the software update and what's notable. Not a lot, but a little bit more colorful. So I hope that's useful for now. Thank you for watching and we'll see you in another video soon. Thank you very much.